What is going on everybody? My name is Tatro and today I want to talk about a really important topic for those of you that are creating your own music. Um, maybe you have gotten familiar with the technical side of your DAW. Maybe you have been watching my music theory tutorials and learning more about how to actually compose music. And those are both very important things, but there's sort of this third area that doesn't get talked about so much because it's very subjective, and that is your sound selection. Today, the sponsor for today's video is Naroth Audio, and before we talk about that, I think we should set the mood. All right, so the reason we've set the mood here today is because I'm gonna be working with a plugin called Mood Guitars by Naroth Audio today. It's a really beautiful sort of uh, guitar sampled plugin that runs within Contact. And you all know that I love lo-fi music. I love kind of moody guitars, so this is just perfect. And as we talk about sound selection today, I'm actually gonna be working a lot with this plugin to show you how you can build up the different parts of your track and how sound selection plays a role in that. And I am gonna be talking about this through the lens of creating a lo-fi chill beat. However, the principles here are actually uh, universal amongst most genres of music, especially contemporary electronic music. The easiest way I can explain it for you to think about is think about a typical rock band. You have your drummer, they're laying down the rhythm. You have your bass, which is rock solid foundation for the harmony, but also semi-rhythmic in sync with the drums as well. You have your guitar player, who will play chords, you know, adding to the harmony, but will also rip on some solos or some melodic riffs as well. And then you have your singer, who is usually front and center, singing the top line melody of the whole track. Those four major parts, even if you don't play in a rock band and you're a beat maker like me or a music producer, those four core fundamental parts are foundational to you understanding how you should choose your sounds and what each sound should be doing. So I'm gonna continue to reference that throughout the video. All right, so I've got a preset loaded here, the BMG Stratocaster, and these are all sampled uh, guitar instruments. And as you can see from the user interface, which is quite beautiful, I would say, there's a bit more going on than just having a sampled guitar instrument, right? We hear a lot going on there. What do you hear? You might hear some tape grit, you hear some reverb, you hear a little bit of a pad as well, which I think is really important to note here. So under layers, pad. I love a good pad instrument and I love a good guitar instrument. So if I pull the pad all the way back, you basically just get the pure guitar. Let's crank that pad up and that gives us a nice, beautiful ambient pad undertone to it. Love that, it's super spacious, which of course we can add to that spaciousness with the built-in reverb, which we do have a convolution reverb. So that's a band pass. Then we have a cathedral reverb. You notice that we can adjust the mix, I have it cranked for demonstration. And then we have intimate more of like a smaller room. Now what you're hearing that crackly kind of noise as well because we've got a couple adjustments here that we can make like dust. Bring that up. That's really dirty. Then tape of course. Just a lot of tape noise there if you want, but I would say, you know, like a good spice, you want to add just a little bit. And of course, we can change our sort of mix of the cassette characteristics here. You can sort of hear a wow and flutter situation, and we can also increase the rate of that. And that's gonna help us really define some of the lo-fi aspects of the sound that we're going for. Of course, we have things like width, EQ profile, which I'll use as we go through, and then we have a built-in tape delay. And one last thing before we write our first riff is that there's three moods for each guitar, hence the name Mood Guitar. And 
and I think we'll be able to use each one as we go through here today. All right, so that's just a quick overview of this plugins interface. Let's get to making some music. All right, so my first sound that I'm going to use here is an acoustic guitar sound from Mood Guitars, and I'm using Mood 1. Let me run a first loop. So when I'm coming up with a track, you can start all kinds of different ways, but I'm going to come up with sort of a, a opening melody. You can think of this, if we refer back to our band analogy, as sort of the, the singer. All right, so that's a decent opening riff there. I was sort of trying to emulate a typical guitar style, which isn't necessarily a one line melody, but more of a strummed instrument. So if I mute these notes at the top here, I'm identifying that as sort of my underlying harmony, my underlying bass line. So probably the easiest thing to do here is to load up a bass instrument and right away, just get into laying down a bass line. One big suggestion I can have for you is that as you are building your track and adding more and more sounds, try to keep it simple in terms of where you're pulling sounds from. If you're using, you know, say a serum and then something from Analog Lab and then Massive, like you're pulling from a bunch of different sources which have their own tendencies towards different genres. And if you do that too much, it's just gonna sound like, you know, imagine just cooking and you took ingredients from every different kind of meal that you make and tried to make one meal with them. Um, chances are it's probably not gonna taste very good. Not to say you can't mix genres and mix sounds, but sometimes we just sort of arbitrarily wanna throw everything into the pot and cook with it all at once. So I, do this a lot. I'm doing this with Mood Guitars today. They are, of course, the sponsor for the video, so it makes sense. But regardless of that, I usually work within one or two sound libraries, you know, per track. I'm not trying to go way out there. And it's a good limitation to put on yourself. And again, not reinventing the wheel here. I'm basically going to play in a lower octave this same exact bass line that is in the initial melody. So let's go ahead and lay down that bass line. So again, back to the foundational idea of sound selection. We have a leading melody and we have a bass line. And the other thing about me working within the same library, like let's go ahead and add another layer of guitars, right? It's another guitar preset, it's from the same library, but it does sound fundamentally different than our initial riff. That initial sound being an acoustic guitar, this next sound being a Telecaster, uh, electric clean guitar sound. So with this initial riff, we have a nice melody. It's sort of like the singer on top, right? But what about like an accompanying sort of riff melody that's repeated? We can totally add to that. noticing is I probably want to be in an octave above that initial melody so they don't clash. So I'm going to play up here. Great. Um, I think that's going to work out pretty well. Let's go back and give it a listen. Go ahead and quantize it. And I did want this G note here to pop out a little bit more. So I'm going to just bring up the velocity there. And there's a few mixing things we can do to maybe get it to fit a little bit better. We could perhaps pan this melody. I 
Another analogy I use all the time is like furniture in the space, right? Like what is the center point? You've got your couch and then maybe there's a chair next to the couch and a lamp and a plant and it all comes together and fits in this room. But if a space gets too crowded, you don't want to put, you know, too many pillows or blankets on the couch or else it looks cluttered, right? It's a similar thing here. We have two melodies happening, but they each have their own place. And this being a repeated riff and less of like a soaring line that a singer would sing. It's more of like a chant in the background. It's sort of like our brains can allow it to happen at the same time as that other melody because it's part of the scene where the melody on top, it's a lot simpler. They can coexist. I hope that that makes sense because what often happens is we try to have too many of a similar type of melody at the same time, um, riffs and then leading lines, which we don't really want. Another example of not reinventing the wheel is if you have a very strong melody, a very strong part that you want to draw the listener's attention to, it's okay to double that melody on a different instrument. So for instance, I have another instance of mood guitar loaded up here. It's got a lot of pad on it. It's another uh, acoustic instance. And what I wanna do is take my initial melody, hold options and just copy it down here to that track. And I'm gonna put it up an octave. Layering these two melodies in octaves, I think is gonna be really successful. Let's actually group them together. Solo this group. And with a little bit of mixing, like let's bring down the higher octave because higher sounds stick out a bunch more, whether you're using like effects risers that are super noisy or higher melodies. The higher pitched sounds are easier to hear, so definitely be careful of that when you're doing higher octave stuff. We don't have to push it volume wise. What I'm gonna do is even out the velocities here as well. It sounds super crunchy, right? Kinda like it. And if a part is worth having in your track, it's really easy to know. Just turn one track off. So as I turn that higher octave off, I do notice that we lose something. We lose some of that higher atmosphere. And I like what it adds to it. Once we add that bass in, it's really robust, and then we have the counter sort of riff melody, right? I like this bed of sound that we have right now. Let me jump off of mood guitars for a second, and I'm actually going to add some piano. I'm going to use the soft piano from Labs by Spitfire Audio, which is entirely free if you didn't know. This is one of my favorite pianos to use for lo-fi. And I am sort of gonna follow the um, harmony of the initial guitar riff with having C and F as my two basic root notes. But I wanna just play a sort of sustain. Clustery kind of chords. So let's kind of layer that in. Very, very basic. I wouldn't be surprised if you could almost barely hear it, but that's okay because this is not supposed to be the front and center melody. This is just supposed to add to our scene. And let me actually strip some stuff away. I'll strip that counter melody out and that higher octave out as well. I've 
stretch the note lengths to create more sustain. And a place like this where the note may be stuck out a little too much, I'll pull back on the velocity. But you do notice that initial opening melody has its own shape. And what I want to do, if I'm going to play any type of um, sort of counter melody on the piano, is fit in between. So if the top melody is sustaining a note, that gives me space to open up on the piano, which we sort of hear happen here. So there's just a few notes in between the hits on the initial melody. It all fits together like a puzzle piece. You don't want too much overlap and too much happening at the same time. And again, remember that I'm viewing this piano, this counter riff melody, as something that fits as part of the background of the track. I don't necessarily need to draw the listener's attention to it too much. You want to know what role each part of your track plays. Is it part of the foundation? Is it part of the scenery? Or is it supposed to be front and center? Those are the things you should be asking yourself with each initial part that gets added. Now there's space for a little more scenery here and you all know that I am a sucker for a good pad sound. So what I'm gonna do here is load up uh, the Stratocaster preset from Mood Guitars. What I kinda wanna do is eliminate not all of the guitar sound, but I want to bring up the attack so that we don't hear really the pluck of the guitar. I might pull back the guitar volume a little bit, but I definitely wanna crank this pad sound. I've got a big cathedral reverb on there as well. I've got the width nice and wide, which we can of course adjust. But I wanna keep it wide because it's a big uh, pad. And what I wanna do is sort of back those chords, similar to what I did in the piano, but with less movement. Let's layer that in there. Alright, so just some nice chords in there. I noticed that I maybe hit the velocity a bit too hard on one of these top notes. It just stuck out a little bit too much. But this sound here provides just a beautiful atmosphere. So we've turned this guitar instrument now into this beautiful ambient pad. Again, part of the scenery, but we don't have any other instruments really playing chords here, like long drawn out chords. The piano is playing some long tones the bass line is providing that foundation for our chord progression, but it's not full chords. And of course, our melodies are implying a certain tonality. They're implying a key. They're implying a chord progression. So this is a beautiful atmosphere, but there's no drums in it yet. So now let's go ahead and just add some drums really quick. Let's keep it simple. Okay, so sound selection within drums is also ultra important. And obviously we can't do drums with the guitar library that we're working in. So we have to go find some drums from another library. Now, I'm not going to go into splice and go into my favorite Boy Wonder trap kit or my murder beats pack that I really like on splice. Those are for like heavy, harder hitting trap beats. I'm not going to go into like the super like K-pop drum samples that I like. I'm going to look for samples that specifically cater to this genre lo-fi and I want to create a mood. I want to create a nostalgic feel. So I'm looking for something that's more field recording based, more acoustic sounding and more lo-fi, low fidelity kind of samples. And I've actually created my own sample pack that was specifically made for uh, lo-fi. I've made a couple of them, but my sample pack uh, called Haze. I think has some drum sounds that will be really fitting for this track. So I'm going to go into this pack, which by the way, of course, the links to all the things that I'm using are in the description. Let's pick a kick drum first. And 
with the drums, it's not only about sound selection, it's about what the drums are doing, right? That's the two facets of this whole video. The sound selection and what are those sounds doing? We're not reinventing the wheel here. This is a lo-fi beat. If no matter what genre you're making, I'm sure with the rhythm, there are some rules to work within. You should work within the rules of the actual music you're trying to make. Yeah. All right, so a kick, that kick sounds good. I also want to find, see how these are just kind of like light percussive sounds. I don't want a bright snare. That one sounds good. So I'm gonna work with these as my backbeat, right? Kick and snare, that is foundational in your drums. Once you build the kick and snare, you can build everything else around that. And I'm gonna want my snare hits to be on beat three right here. So I'm literally just going to repeat that. Simplicity is key here. We got this snare hit on beat three throughout this entire loop. Now let's build the kick around that. Boom, boom, ka. I'm already hearing it in my head before I actually lay it down. Not like that. That's better. All right, I'm just gonna speed through this, finish laying down my kick pattern, and we'll add a few more percussive notes. So now that I've got a really foundational uh, kick and snare backbeat, then we can start to add other percussive elements. And I'm going to pull from the same pack once again. I'm not going crazy. Of course, you can mix sounds. You can mix packs. But if your music is not coming out the way you want it to sound, maybe you are reaching to too many things. Maybe you are collecting uh, too many sounds, too many VSTs, too many samples. Stick within one pack and make the most of it when you can. Unless you have a very clear idea, oh, I know that one sound in that one other pack will fit perfectly. Until you know that, it's not worth just going off into random parts of your library. Because then you'll just get excited by things that sound cool and different, but don't necessarily work together. So I'm just going to grab another percussive sound here and see how I can make it fit around the snare. That might be a little too fast. Cool. and I'm going to work with this one sound and create a couple more rhythmic patterns. Now, these other percussion sounds that I'm adding are not part of the backbeat. They are working around the backbeat, so I'm not going to align them with the kick and the snare for the most part. I'm going to make them bounce off of each other. They're playing a purpose. Dot, dot. Not bad. I don't really like the way that sounds lined up with the kick there. I do like that. So I might take this two bar pattern here and repeat it at bar five, which is where this cycle sort of starts over again anyway. And maybe this time we only have one hit happen. Little variation, because I know my plan is to now add in another percussive sample, which is gonna play its own role. And a lot of people ask me, why am I not working in drum rack versus working like this? It's because I can see literally every single hit and how they're interacting with each other. And I can also um, have access to better mixing. just like that one little hit sort of anticipating that kick there again that's why I love being able to see it all on the timeline see that I've got kind of nothing going on in this area in terms of the extra percussion so here we go So we can 
can sort of see that we've got a fairly built up um, kind of backbeat and a little bit of extra percussion. Of course, there's probably room for more without a doubt, but there's one key factor of the drums that's missing, and that's like um, some type of excitement and momentum that is usually provided by a steady hi-hat or a shaker. So I definitely have shaker loops in this pack. Let me see if any of them fit here. Not one shots, shaker loops, yeah. Let's just drop them in and see if they fit. That pattern's fine. Let me just try a couple other patterns. That works. So you can see how fundamentally this shaker loop is not getting in the way of anything. It's not too overbearing. If I turn it off, we lose some energy. When I turn it back on, we gain a little bit of momentum and energy. And remember, we're working in an eight bar loop right now. This is about to get arranged and you know, we're gonna space these ideas out a little more and build up to them. But in the same way that all of our sounds are working together and we don't want them to conflict with each other, you can think of that on a more zoomed in level with the drums on their own, because think of a drum set. It's a collection of instruments. It's not just one instrument. They're working together to provide the one uh, sort of rhythm of the track, but it's a bunch of instruments working together to do that. So think of it the same way. You don't want anything to be conflicting. Uh, you want everything to be working together and you want the foundational elements like the kick snare backbeat, as well as the shaker or the hi-hat, something to excite and drive the track forward with momentum. Everything is very purposeful, and this is in all genres, trap music, uh, there's all kinds of hi-hat, hi-hat stutters, things like that, um, and any type of electronic music, and in any type of acoustic music as well, in orchestral music, there are percussive elements, snare rolls that sort of build up momentum, the way violins uh, strum faster and faster builds up momentum. It all translates between the different genres. Orchestration is orchestration. It's pretty universal. All right, and a last layer. On the note of adding sounds from other libraries and, you know, whether to stay in one or go to others. Remember, like I said, if you have an idea, like a specific sound could fit really well here, then feel free, branch out. So for instance, I love including vocals in my music. It adds to this organic nostalgic feel for sure. So I think what I'm gonna do is pull from this contact play series sound glaze, which is a vocal synth. And let's see how we can make this fit. I think, again, since we already sort of have a top line melody happening, we probably want this to play a background riff similar to the other guitar. Let's see how it fits in there. Right, so that fits well, right? And one of the reasons it fits well is because it's sort of got this offbeat, upbeat feel to it. Where everything else sort of lands right on a downbeat besides some of the floaty guitars. It's not getting in the way, it fits in the scenery nicely. It's also working because it's not a guitar or a super atmospheric sound. It is very clearly a voice. Uh, so it's the only thing of that sonic quality in the track. So uh, it doesn't get lost in the other guitars because it's not a guitar. And in this moment right here, you notice how many instrument tracks are we using? We'll count the drums all as one. So drums, um, we've got 
the vocal synth that we just added. We've got the main melody, which we do have layered in octaves, but I'm going to count that as only one. We've got a bass line, we've got a guitar riff, we've got synth pads, and we've got piano. That's only seven layers. And actually that almost feels like a lot, but they are all working together uh, quite well in my opinion. So when I broke it down for you earlier, I talked about drummer, bassist, guitarist, singer. That analogy of the band, each one of these seven layers, because this is electronic music, this isn't just a you know band playing in a garage or on a stage somewhere. All seven of these elements fit into some of those categories. Bass is, of course, the bass. Drums is, of course, the drums. A lot of these elements are playing into the guitar element of the band, right? They are providing a harmony. They're playing chords or they're contributing to the chords. And then they're also playing a riff. That's why I see a lot of bands with two guitar players or a guitar player and a keyboardist, right? They play both those roles. And then the melody on top is, of course, the singer. So they are all fitting into those roles and there's only seven layers. I listen to so many tracks um, from people who are just starting out making music and Again, it's that idea of take all the ingredients in the kitchen and try to use them all at once because you're excited. You learned how to use this new program or you bought a bunch of new VSTs or you got a bunch of new samples. Let's use all of them. No, try to restrain. Try to have a little bit of discipline and pull back and make sure every element of your beat has a function, has a purpose, and is working together and not clashing. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take this eight bar loop and I'm going to try to expand it out across the timeline and fill it out a little bit more as a track. I might make some tweaks to some of the parts, um, but as we go through here, I'm going to try to go ahead and, you know, make a finished track here. So give me a moment to do that and we'll be back with a more full arrangement and I'll tell you about it. All right, so a couple key factors I've added in here. I added a field recording that I actually captured myself. This is also in my Haze sample pack. This is running through the background of the whole track. It's like birds and forest air. Another element of the track that I added is uh, some risers and some effect sounds. This riser sounds like this. These are just from Splice. Just super airy risers to connect our sections. And then I also added a mastering chain, which is why you're hearing a little bit of noise on top because I want that tape noise. Um, but I use the J37 on top of that. And then I took all of our musical ideas and I sprawled them out across the timeline and we got a nice about three minute track. So I'm sure you want to hear what this track sounds like all together. I'm going to show you that in one moment. Um, but I want to remind you that today's video was sponsored by Naroth Audio with their Mood Guitars plugin, which is a very, very beautiful um, guitar ambient lo-fi plugin that I think you'll have a lot of fun with. Check the link in the description. Please uh, support the sponsor. When you support the sponsor, you're supporting the channel. Uh, we'll see more of Naroth Audio on this channel, I think, because I really love what they're doing with uh, their sounds. And not to mention, this is a really cool UI style. Maybe one day we'll work on a Tedro plugin with Naroth Audio. Who knows? But anyway, links to all the sounds and gear you saw today are in the description. You can get a free sample pack if you become a VIP member. So hit the join button down below if that's something that interests you. But nonetheless, let's get into it. Here is the final beat. Mm -hmm. 